In this video, I'm going to provide a very brief review of the Ecdysozoa. There are three learning goals. We want you to be able to define Ecdysis. We want you to be familiar with the main lineages within Ecdysozoa, especially Nematoda and Panarthropoda. And last, we want you to distinguish the main lineages within Panarthropoda. Ecdysozoa are part of the protosomes group on the metazoan phylogeny. So they are bilaterian animals and in the protostomes. As such, their blastopore develops into a mouth. Although we say they have spiral mosaic cleavage in protostomes, ecdysozoans are one of the groups in which this varies. And so arthropods in general do their own thing and don't have spiral mosaic cleavage. If we zoom in more closely, I've highlighted Ecdysozoa for you, you can see there are many different groups. We're gonna spend time talking about two, the nematodes and the arthropods. The first thing to notice is the Ecdysozoan namesake, which is Ecdysis. Ecdysis is the process by which an animal sheds its external skeleton. So all ecdysozoa molt a chitinous exoskeleton. This is pretty well known in groups like insects where we can see things like cicadas emerging from their old exoskeleton. What you may not notice is that this happens throughout the animal's life. So something like a lepidopteran, once it emerges from an egg, it's going to go through several rounds of ecdysis as it grows towards a pupal stage and eventually a butterfly. Scorpions, spiders, crabs, shrimp, etc. also all do ecdysis. The other group that we're going to talk about in ecdysozoa are nematodes. And although nematodes are largely microscopic, they also shed an exoskeleton. If you look closely at this slide on the right hand side, you see the remnants of the nematode exoskeleton as it's being shed. Although your book does a pretty good job of defining subgroups in ecdysozoa, we're gonna get a little bit more specific. This is a phylogeny from a recent paper, and I want you to sort of orient yourself around key landmarks. The first is the purple node here. That's ecdysozoa. Remember, ecdysozoa includes two groups. It includes the nematoda, which is here in orange, and the panarthropoda, which is here in red. Now, your book doesn't talk too much about two lineages within panarthropoda, the tardigrades and the onychophorans. And we're gonna follow that trend and really focus largely on a smaller subgroup within panarthropoda, which is this note here. Many people call that the U arthropoda, but we're going to just refer to it as the arthropods. And we're gonna focus on a few specific groups. We're gonna focus on the chalicerates. We're gonna focus on myriapods, malacostricans, and hexapods. Before we get to the arthropods, let's first think about nematodes. Nematodes are an incredibly diverse group. There's at least 80,000 species that are, de that are described and many more that remain to be described. They have diverse lifestyles in accord with their diversity. There's predators, parasites, etc. And one of the amazing things about them is that they're found in all habitats on Earth. So from mountain peaks all the way to oceanic trenches, they are probably the most broadly distributed animal. They have reduced musculature and a digestive system that's been simplified, and we refer to their body plan as pseudocoelomate. Remember, in this case, 
we have a mesoderm that lines part of the coelom, but the endoderm still re remains and lines part of the rest of the coelom. They're significant in agriculture, both as pests and beneficials in medicine. Many are some extreme human parasites, which are super interesting. Of course, whenever you talk about nematodes, we should always mention C. elegans, which is a model organism in many genetic labs, even on campus. Focusing a little bit more closely on the phylogeny I've shown you, we want to now talk about panarthropoda. Remember, this is a hugely diverse group. In fact, it occupies at least 80% of all animals on the tree of life. And there are innumerable body forms, life histories, and ecologies. We don't talk about all of these organisms, but we focus our efforts on just four. The myriapods, the chelicerates, the malacostricans, and the hexapods. Recall that I showed you that arthropoda is a lineage within panarthropoda. Essentially, we're eliminating onychophorans and tardigrades. Some people call that euarthropoda, but we'll call it arthropoda. Within arthropoda, there are four big lineages that we want to be familiar with. The first are the hexapods, or the insects. The second are the chelicerates. The third are malacostricans and the fourth are the myriapods. If we first consider the insects, the thing that should stand out to anybody who even starts to consider them is that they are a hyperdiverse lineage. There's at least 850,000 described species of insects and many more remain to be described. To put that into context, we just finished plants, and there's about 250,000 species of angiosperms. So this is several orders of magnitude more diverse. As such, they pretty much do everything. They're terrestrial, they're aquatic, both marine and freshwater. They have three tagmata. Recall that tagmata are the fusion of multiple segments. And the three tagmata in insects are a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. There's one pair of antennae. There are three pairs of legs or six legs. And then there are one or two pairs of wings when they're present. Not all insects have wings, not only because they don't have them ancestrally, but also because they've lost them independently. Either way, if they're there, there's either two wings with some associated structures, or there are four wings. The chelicerates includes many groups that are familiar to you, like spiders, mites, ticks, and scorpions, but also organisms that you probably saw for the first time in lab, like the horseshoe crabs. There are two tagmata, so a cephalothorax and an abdomen. There are specialized feeding appendages called chelicerae. In spiders, the chelicerae bear a poisonous venom gland and fang. And then there are four pairs of walking legs and pedipalps. Mites and ticks violate this rule a little bit. Sometimes they've lost a pair of their legs and there are only six, but in general, chelicerates have four pairs of walking legs and one pair of pedipalps. They can be predators, herbivores, parasites. Many are medically significant, things like mites and ticks. And of course, arachnids are the most diverse. Malacostricans are what most older textbooks refer to as the crustaceans. But remember, crustacea is not monophyletic if we exclude insects. So we include malacostricans, and insects into this new group we call pancrustacea. This includes the crabs, the shrimps, the lobsters. They are also hugely diverse with at least 50,000 described species in marine, freshwater, and although you may not realize it, terrestrial habitats as well. 
And I don't mean just crabs. Things like isopods are also part of this lineage and they never return for water, even for reproduction. They can be scavengers, filter feeders, and predators. Again, once you get to this level of diversity, they sort of do it all. Last are the myriapods. This includes centipedes and millipedes. Myriapods are many segmented. That's where they get their namesake, myriad. And they are terrestrial, almost exclusively, with varying numbers of legs per segment. There's about 16,000 described species, and there are two groups that we focus on. The centipedes, which have one pair of legs per segment, all of which are predaceous. They also have some modifications to their head with a poison claw. And the millipedes, which have two pairs of legs per segment most of the time, and they're all herbivorous.